Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the second lecture in uh, our 2014-2015 series. Uh, my name's Karen Chapman, and I work in this building, the Queen's Medical Research Institute, on the third floor. Um, you're in one of three university buildings on this site, all belonging to the, um, to the University of Edinburgh, part of the, school, the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine. So there's this building, the Queen's Medical Research Institute. There's the um, Centre for Regenerative Medicine across on the other side of the campus. And there's also the Chancellor's Building next to the hospital. So we have three research centres in this building. Um, on the top floor, we have the Centre for Cardiovascular Science, which is the centre that I'm in, and also that my two colleagues, the speakers tonight, are from. In the middle floor, we've got the Centre for Inflammation Research, and on the ground floor is the Centre for Reproductive Health. <coughs> so we have two speakers tonight. Um, Dr. Mandy Drake is a clinical uh, a clinician. She's a paediatric endocrinologist, so she spends quite a bit of her time at the Sick Kids Hospital. And we have Professor Nick Morton, who's trained as a basic scientist. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Mandy Drake. Okay, well, thanks to Karen for um, inviting me to speak, and thank you all for coming along on um, really quite a cold day. So as Karen says, I'm a, a paediatric endocrinologist, so I spend a bit of my time at the sick kids um, seeing children predominantly with growth and puberty disorders, but I actually also um, work in the lab and run a lab group um, who are um, working here in the Centre for Cardiovascular Science. So this is, I hope, the talk that you think you've, you've come to see. That's certainly the talk you're going to get. Um, and I'm really just going to set the scene um, and tell you um, a little bit about obesity. What do we mean by it and how do we measure it? I'm going to show you what the prevalence is in both adults and children and particularly focusing on the figures here in Scotland. I'm going to discuss with you why it matters. I'm then going to spend some time talking about um, maternal obesity, which we've got a big interest here in Edinburgh. And then just a few slides on potential causes. So what do we mean by obesity? Well, this is the World Health Organization definition. That obesity is abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. And I'm sure that all of you would have absolutely no difficulty recognizing that the cartoon on this slide is showing somebody who's obese and therefore not likely to be somebody who's very healthy. So in terms of how we measure it, I'm sure you're all aware of the use of the body mass index as a measure of obesity. And that's the relationship between our weight in kilograms and our height in meters squared. And this allows us to use some definitions and cutoffs for what we regard as a healthy weight and what we would regard as being overweight um, or obese. And a healthy weight is um, suggested to be a BMI between 18.5 and 24.9, overweight between 25 and 29.9, and then obesity really is anybody with a BMI of over 30. Now this is not a perfect measurement by any stretch of the imagination. For example, there are, there are sort of lots of sportsmen, particularly I think rugby players, who have got a lot of muscle mass and have a BMI of over 30, but in no way would you think that they were unhealthy or, or overweight. And also this really, um, really would only apply to the <coughs> Caucasian population here in the UK, and there are different cutoffs in other countries. For example, individuals in India will suggest that anybody with a BMI of over 23 might be unhealthy for their population. And that's because for any given BMI, they would have a higher percentage fat mass. So this is not a perfect measurement, but at least it gives us a guide. What we can do in addition um, is use the measurement of waist circumference, so just measuring somebody's waist. And using both waist circumference and body mass index gives us some indication as to who's at risk of disease. So that's really how we measure it in adults. It's imperfect, we use it as a guide. What about in children? Well, it's a little bit different in children. Firstly, we don't use waist circumference because as yet that's not been shown to really add anything to um, our definition of obesity or our associations with disease risk. And the reason it's a little bit different in children is that body mass index normally changes as a child develops. 
So I've just put this chart in here and I'll take you through it. Some of you may have seen these sorts of centile charts before. The younger members of the audience will all have had a red book assigned to them when they were younger. And this is a red book that mums dutifully fill in with heights and weights on centile charts such as these, which really show us how children should normally grow. And this is a centile chart for body mass index. This isn't in your red book, but it's pretty similar. And across the bottom of the chart is your age in years, going from birth to 18. And up the side of the chart is body mass index. And all I really want you to take from this is that body mass index changes over the lifespan. So if we just follow somebody who's growing along this dark blue line in the middle here, at birth, they may have a BMI which is normal at 18. So that will be lower than you would expect in adults. And that would actually fall so that when they were 16, a normal BMI for them, so when they were six, a normal BMI for them might only be 16. <laughs> and then BMI rises through late childhood to what we'd regard as normal for adults. So we use BMI in children, but we use it slightly differently. So what about the prevalence? How common is obesity? Now, some of you may have seen these sorts of um, pictures before, and I've used them here just because I think they're so impressive to look at. So this is looking at the prevalence of obesity as defined by a BMI of over 30 in adults in the US, and looking at the change between 1990 and 2010. And the colours that the states have been coloured in reflect the prevalence of obesity in those states at that time. So blue indicates a relatively low prevalence of obesity, <coughs> of sort of less than 10% or 10 to 15%, and red is a very high prevalence of obesity. And what you can clearly see is that back in the 1990s, obesity was not as common as it is now, so that in about a third of US states, the prevalence of obesity is greater than 30%. And there's been a huge shift in prevalence over time. So what about in Scotland? In Scottish adults to begin with, what's our prevalence? After all, this is the home of the deep fried Mars bar, so we shouldn't expect that everybody will be slim. So I'm going to get you to do some work now and tell me what you think the prevalence of overweight and obesity is in Scottish adults. So if we first look at the prevalence of overweight and obesity class together, and I've got three different figures here for you to choose from, I'd like you to put up your hands if you think that 53% of the population are overweight and obese. Okay, so a few people think that. <coughs> put your hands up if you think it's 64.6%. 64, 64 and a few more people. And now those of you who think it's around about 80%. Okay, so a few people. I will tell you what it is in a second, but if we just look at the numbers who are obese... So, hands up if you think that's around about 19.5%. Okay, 27.1%. A few more people. 32.3%. Most people. Okay, so these are in fact the correct figures. So around about 65% of the Scottish adults are either overweight or obese. And 27% of those are obese. That's a BMI of over 30 so this is just showing this graphically, but also showing the change in prevalence over time. So this is um, going from 1995 to I think 2013, just there. The top line is overweight and obesity, the prevalence of that. So we've got percentage um, upside. And then the bottom line is obesity alone. And I think what you can see from this is that the prevalence of overweight and obesity has increased over time as you've seen in those pictures from the States. So that in 1995, around about 50% of the population were overweight and obese. And now we've gone up to around 65%. And a similar increase in the rate of obesity, going from around 18% to 27%. So we may not be as extreme as what we've seen in the US, but certainly the prevalence of obesity in adults is quite shocking and is increasing. What about in Scottish children? And again, really quite shocking figures that almost 30% of Scottish children are either overweight or obese. And 16% of those are obese. 
I think perhaps somewhat reassuringly is that the prevalence hasn't really changed over time and it would be lovely to think that this downward trend in the rate of overweight and obesity would continue but I think we can't say that for sure yet but certainly the prevalence is worryingly high even in our children aged between 2 and 15. So why does it matter? <clears throat> obesity is a very sensitive subject. As clinicians, we find it quite difficult to address with our patients. Patients are often embarrassed or, or become angry or it's not something that we want to discuss. So why do we go on about it so much? We go on about it a lot because it's associated with a lot of other health problems. So I'm sure that most people will be able to tell you that obesity will be associated with an increased risk of heart disease, such as high blood pressure, heart attacks or stroke. And that it's also associated with an increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes, and it certainly is. But it's associated with a host of other diseases as well. So just briefly, if we go around here, it's associated with an increased risk of chest problems, such as asthma or chronic um, lung disease, an increased prevalence of gallstones, liver disease, and that includes cirrhosis um, and liver cancer, problems with your joints, problems with depression, much more common in people who are obese. Um, and then uh, with a number of cancers, particularly breast cancer. So it's not just obesity that we worry about, but we worry about it because it's associated with all these other health problems. What about in children? Well, they don't get away scot-free. Obesity in childhood is associated, again, with many health problems. As a paediatric endocrinologist, it's associated with problems with the endocrine system. We used to think that type 2 diabetes was something that only happened in adulthood. We're now seeing it in children. We tend to see early puberty, so um, in particularly in obese girls, tend to go into puberty early. And they're at increased risk of developing polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is associated with infertility later on. It's also associated with the development of heart disease risk factors even in childhood. So higher blood pressure, problems with blood lipids such as cholesterol, we see those emerging even in childhood. And again, this is a particular problem that is associated with psychological distress, depression um, and low self-esteem. But again, as we saw in the adult picture, it's associated with problems with bones and joints, kidneys, um, with the gut um, and with the lungs. So children don't get away scot-free um, when they're obese. So it does matter to the individual. But in fact, it matters to us all. <coughs> and it matters to, it all, uh, to us all because of the, the economic impact that obesity has. And there was a very recent study, and this was very much publicized in the press last week, and some of you may have seen it, um, that the McKinsey Global Institute had a look at what the economic in, um, impact of Scotland might be. And they worked out how much obesity might cost Scotland per annum. Okay, so every year, how much does obesity cost Scotland? So again, I'm going to get you to participate just to wake you up if you're dropping off. And I've got three figures for you to choose from here. So I'd ask you to put up your hands if you think that obesity costs Scotland £165 million pounds every year. Nobody. Okay, oh, I've, I've spilled that. <laughs> okay, that's how much it costs Scotland every year. So £4.6 billion. Pounds. It's the cost to Scotland every year of obesity. So actually, what do we spend that money on? Why does it cost so much money? It's because of really a combination of factors, including loss of productivity. So because of early death, people can't work for as long. Because of impaired quality of life, so people find, might find that they're less able to work. They may be more prone to taking time off work because of illnesses, hospital appointments, management of their, of their chronic health conditions. So loss of productivity costs Scotland a lot of money. There are the direct healthcare costs of looking after people with these chronic healthcare conditions. So type 2 diabetes particularly costs the NHS an awful lot of money. And then finally, all the investment that we're needing to put in to try and reduce the impact or even the prevalence of obesity. <coughs> so all of those things cost Scotland an awful lot of money. And you can imagine what we might spend that on instead, building a new hospital, hiring more nurses, hiring more doctors spending more money on expensive drugs for, for other conditions. <coughs> it matters to us all globally 
So now I'm going to guess you, and try not to spoil this, get you to guess what the global impact of obesity is. And I think you're probably guessing by now that it's actually costing us quite a bit of money. So I'd like you to put your hands up for how much you think it costs globally. Okay, so hands up those who think it costs 58.9 billion. Okay, nobody? 98.2 billion? A few people? <laughs> 1.3 trillion. I can't even conceive how much money this is. But in fact, you're right, that's how much it costs worldwide, the management of obesity or dealing with obesity. And it's responsible for about 5% of deaths worldwide. So not only does it matter to the individual, but it matters very much to us all. But it doesn't necessarily stop there. And it may not only impact on us today, but impact on future generations as well. So because the prevalence of obesity is increasing, we're seeing more women who are obese during pregnancy. And this is just a graph illustrating this. Um, so this is the figures from the UK um, for the last number of years, between 1990 and 2010. The top line going across here shows the increase in the prevalence of obesity in the general population over that time. And the bottom line shows the increase in the prevalence of obesity amongst pregnant women. And we know that here in Edinburgh, around about 20% of women are obese during pregnancy, so a significant number of women. And that's important because maternal obesity during pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of pregnancy complications. So women are more likely to develop high blood pressure or diabetes during pregnancy or need cesarean sections. This is associated with babies being born bigger, so a higher birth weight, and also with an increased <coughs> risk of childhood obesity. And work that was done here in Edinburgh has shown that the adult offspring of obese women are more likely to develop heart disease and are more likely to die earlier. And so what we're looking at here is a potential intergenerational cycle, so the potential to transmit the obesity risk across generations from um, parents to children, from mother to daughter. So we're doing a lot of work on this in Edinburgh at the moment, um, and funded by Tommy's, we've set up a clinic in which we study pregnant women who are obese and lean control. So these are women with a BMI of over 40, so extremely obese. We studied them during pregnancy to see if we can try and work out how to lower their risk of complications. And I'm very much involved in following up the babies born to these women. So this is a baby in a Peapod machine which measures body composition. And we've been measuring body composition in the babies of obese and control women. Um, and then we're now following these, these um, children up as they, they're going through early childhood. And Teresa is here somewhere in the audience, and she's actually organising the follow-up for these children to look at things like what they eat, what their um, psychological state is like, and well, you can ask Teresa about it later on. So we're very much in involved in trying to work out what the problems are associated with maternal obesity are. But guys, you don't get away scot-free. We've concentrated a lot with our research on what being um, an obese pregnant woman does to your, you as children, but actually we're starting to realise now that being an obese dad can have implications not just for his children in terms of putting them at increased risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes, but potentially also for his grandchildren. Um, and um, I'm running a number of mouse and rat studies in which we show that this is the case, and we're trying to work out how that might happen. And one of my other PhD students, Tom, who's at, busy doing an experiment at the minute, but popping in and out and hopefully will join us later, is running these experiments trying to work out how this happens. So finally, just a few slides on potential causes. So I found some pictures from Leithwalk Primary School on Google. This is Leithwalk Primary School in the 20s and in the 50s and in 2014. And I'm kind of wondering what's changed in our environment that's leading to the increased prevalence of obesity. What might have changed other than school uniform? <laughs> Although I'm delighted to find out that these children are actually about to do a charity fun run, so I, I'm all in favour of that. So what might be causing obesity? Well, I think we'd all recognise that lifestyle is going to play a really huge part. Nowadays, we've got easy access to cheap not very nutritious food, and this is a burger that you can get at Hungry Horse restaurants apparently, like two donuts, a couple of burgers, some bacon, some cheese, 2,000 calories, <coughs> plenty for a whole day, but just for a single meal. We have a much more sedentary lifestyle, we drive our cars much more often than walking. We've gone from um, a time when we used to be very active at work to 
uh, work being done by machines and with an awful lot of us being chained to our computers 24 hours a day. And our leisure time is spent very differently and certainly what we see with children is that there's very much more telewatching um, and very much more sedentary game playing. So lifestyle is going to have a major impact on the increase in prevalence of obesity. What about our hormones? People are always very interested in whether they might have a hormone problem that's causing their obesity. And sometimes, yes, we do see this, particularly with things like an underactive thyroid can lead you to become obese. But actually, that's not very common. In my clinic, it's not a very common cause of obesity. But yes, your hormones might be important. So actually, what you will come here to see is, is this due to our genes? Well, is there a gene for fatness? Can you affect one gene and cause people to get fat? And the answer is yes, actually. There are a number of genes that if they don't work properly, you might develop obesity. And this is just a picture showing a child with one of those conditions. So this child um, is the same child here at the, about the age of three and about the age of seven. And this child has a defect in a gene that makes the hormone leptin. That's the leptin you produce from your fat, it travels to your brain, it's very important in the control of appetite. This child can't produce any leptin. And so he's hungry all the time. And these children go and food seek. They're absolutely desperate to eat because they can never be filled. And they present with very severe obesity at a very young age. You give them leptin, this happens. They get very much less obese and they develop much more normally. In fact, there's only about 20 children in the world who've ever been described with this. And the other single gene problems are also not very common. So does that mean our genes aren't important at all? And I think the answer to that is probably no. And I'm actually going to hand over to Nick now, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about how our genes might actually be important and the work that he's doing um, to try and tease those, um, those problems out. So just a very quick thanks to me for, um, to my group um, and to the funders that fund my work um, who are shown here. So I'm going to hand over to Nick. We're going to take questions um, at the end. Okay, so thanks very much, Mandy, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I, I kind of started my career here, about a similar age to some of the people in the audience, uh, and I developed an interest in, in chemistry, and I went to university to study chemistry, but that interest slowly mutated over time to become an interest in, in biochemistry, and then through further training in physiology, and metabolism, molecular biology, and finally, and recently, genetics, so I'm not a geneticist. I'm going to talk about that subject from the perspective of what I would call roughly a jack of all trades, maybe biochemist on a good day. And I'm roughly here at the moment, although preparing for a public lecture, I feel like I'm probably around about here, so you have to forgive me. But what I would like to do with that background is really explore two concepts. One is why should our genes have any impact at all on obesity? And the second thing is really to try and concentrate on what the effect those genes have to actually cause the obesity, what scientists like to call mechanism. And that's something we really struggle with because what we do have is a nice long list of genes, but we don't really know the function of most of these genes or the function of the variations in our genome that cause those genes to have the effect on obesity. So bear with me for the next 20, 25 minutes or so and I'll try and give you some insight into that. But the important thing to notice is that our environment is extremely important. Obesity arises through a gene-by-environment interaction. You can't have one without the other. So it's really important, and I'm going to use the same slide that Mandy used, which is the prevalence of obesity in the United States. We can see the darker red states here show very high prevalences of obesity, about 30%. And if we look at lifestyle or environmental causes of obesity, we can take, for example, physical activity. And if you look at the blue colours here, this is where people are doing less activity or less exercise or using their cars. And we can see there's a nice inverse correlation which could lead you to believe that low physical activity is driving obesity. And that would be a fair point. But we can also look at things like the intake of fizzy drinks, sugary drinks, high in fructose corn syrup. And we can see in the darker green states here that there's a very high intake that coincides with the prevalence of obesity. So we could argue that increased fizzy drink intake is a cause of obesity. And that would be a fair point. There are other things. So the, the map on the top right now shows the exposure to toxins, such as bisphenol A and phthalates, which are common plasticizers. And you will find these things in common household items, such as insulation, babies' bottles, toothpaste, plastics. And we're exposed to these things in increasing amounts. And in allusion to uh, Mandy's work, 
we're also exposed in the womb to these uh, toxins. And there is some evidence that these toxins are driving the increase in obesity. <coughs> so with all this evidence that our environment is obesogenic, is driving obesity, is there really any need to invoke genes in this whole picture? And the truth is that our genes have not really changed very much since we were cave dwellers. They have changed even less since we were Cro-Magnon man, becoming modern humans. And no one can really argue that our genes have changed within the last 40 <coughs> years to explain the obesity epidemic. So what is going on there? Well, to understand obesity, you really have to understand some fundamental concepts of how we regulate our body weight. So sorry for the lesson here, but it's really important that you understand this. And on the left-hand side of this equation, this is a cartoon version of our very famous energy balance equation. What we can see is that the amount of fat you store in your fat cells is simply a ratio of how much energy you take in in your food and how much energy you expend, your energy expenditure. 70% of that expenditure is just involved in keeping you in the normal state that you're in. We call this the basal metabolic rate, simply doing nothing, pushing ions in and out of your cells, maintaining your body's integrity against the entropy of the universe, takes about 70% of the energy you take in every day. That leaves 30% or so, which is the work you do on the environment. And so this, is, this sounds a bit like a physics lesson, but it is, it's, it's kind of physics for dummies. This is simply a, an energy balance equation that leads to obesity if it's imbalanced. But what are the important factors that might contribute to that balance? Well, we know that appetite is extremely important. And beyond appetite, we know that larger people require more energy to maintain their body weight, so actually fat people have a higher metabolic rate. Beyond that, we also know that how much we eat depends on social cues, our environment, the palatability of the food. We can see the little girl here is struggling with her broccoli, how the food tastes, social interactions when you're eating. All of these things impact upon your appetite, and many of these things are regulated through complex mechanisms within the brain. What about the other side of the equation? Well, the lucky people around here who are very physically active will only really bring their energy expenditure up to about 30% of their daily requirements, even if they're extremely physically active. That's kind of good news. Sleep. And I've used this to look around the audience to see if anyone is <coughs> resembling the people in this particular slide, including the teachers falling asleep here. Too little sleep or too much sleep is also associated with obesity. Another centrally regulated mechanism which may have genetic influence. And I'm using Mrs. Claus here who's taking a well-deserved break after helping Santa prepare the presents over the Christmas period. One thing you may not have thought about too much is your ambient temperature. So this woman is exposed to extreme cold and she's switched on mechanisms largely regulated by the brain, which make you shiver in response to the cold, and other mechanisms, non-shivering heat production, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. And these have a massive effect on how much energy you will burn, how many calories you will burn. Other factors that are important, gender. We know that females have evolved to have more fat, simply because they have to sustain pregnancy and childbirth, and then lactation, breastfeeding after the baby is born. I won't dwell on that too much. More recently, we've begun to understand that the bacterial populations in your gut have a direct effect on how fat you will become. This is because they help you digest your food. And what about stress? Something I'm feeling acutely now, but people who are chronically exposed to stress, some of those people will comfort eat. And that may interfere with systems in the brain that allow you to regulate your hunger. So there's evidence for this too. So with all of these things, we have to try and integrate that information. And the overall consensus is that our body weight is actually naturally evolved to be within a certain range. So each of us will have a lower limit of our body weight before our brain notices, and an upper limit before our brain notices. Not, you will note, a set point, which is very strictly defined. And there's an easy explanation for that on the lower side of body weight. For example, if this person, we're following this idealized person with their upper and lower limit, and if that person loses weight or carries very little fat, it's pretty obvious from an evolutionary perspective, a genetic perspective, to understand why they would have to increase their food intake or reduce their energy expenditure. It's simply because we've evolved to avoid starvation. Any person who was carrying small amounts of energy as fat, when exposed to a famine, for example, would not be able to transmit their genes to the next generation. That's fairly straightforward. But what about this upper limit? Is there an upper limit? Should there be an upper limit? And do genes play a role in determining that upper limit? And this is where I get a chance to, to ask <laughs> the audience a question, in cartoon format at least. So I'm going to ask you, 
What do you think, and think evolution, would drive or control, or prevent our upper body limit from rising up towards obesity and beyond? <coughs> I'll give you some options first. Is it A, because we were too obese to chase the woolly mammoth and <coughs> eat our dinner? Is it B, because we were the dinner and we could not evade predators? Or C, we were too obese to successfully breed and make the next generation? So can I have a show of hands for A? We couldn't catch our food. Small numbers. What about B? We couldn't avoid our predators. No one's convinced. Maybe one or two, two or three. C, we lost the ability to reproduce. Ah, that's a popular one. I'm glad to tell you that it's wrong. <laughs> well, of course, this is all theory. <laughs> but the truth is that between six and two million years ago, humans were a lot smaller and predators were a lot bigger. Don't think of modern humans, think of hobbits. And this is what we evolved from, something similar to hobbits, that is. And so a person who is obese, who is foraging, would have to spend more time looking for food to maintain their energy balance. It's the equation again. So they're more at risk of predation. And also, they would be fatter, so they'd find it more difficult to evade that predator. So there is good mathematical evidence and modelling evidence that the case is we have been released from predation and with the, le the release of a negative selective pressure on that upper limit for body weight, we end up drifting up simply by having variation in the population between our genes as we go from generation to generation. So now you will have a proportion of the population that can get very obese because there's no negative selective pressure. And this is entirely in line with Darwin's theory of variation and evolution. But is there direct evidence that genes can impact obesity. And Mandy's already really explained this one very nicely, but I'm going to go through how this was actually discovered. On the right-hand side scales, we have a mouse who is at least three times heavier than his littermate brothers here. They were born at the same time. And this mouse has an inactivating mutation in that gene leptin that Mandy mentioned, which makes a hormone released from fat cells. It goes to the brain and tells you to stop eating because you have enough energy on board. So this mouse does not have that hormone, and it effectively eats itself to death. A few years later, after Jeff Friedman discovered this in New York, Steve O'Reilly in Cambridge and his colleagues discovered these extremely rare humans who had these extremely rare mutations in the leptin gene that had the same phenotype. What this means is that mouse biology can reflect human biology, and that's one of the reasons why researchers use mouse models or rodent models to try and understand the mechanisms of disease. So humans, just like rodents, respond to leptin release from the fat cells to control their appetite. And the great news is that with that discovery, doctors and scientists were able to treat that child and make them live a normal life just a few years after they were uh, given leptin. But those cases are extremely rare, so scientists have turned to another kind of uh, situation that is extremely informative for how genes impact obesity, and this is twin studies. So we can see on the top here a panel of identical twins, what we call monozygotic twins, and we can see they have a very similar body shape compared to dizygotic twins. So these are twins that are no more similar than a brother and a sister in the family. These guys have identical genes and an identical environment, at least when they're young. These guys have an identical environment, but dissimilar genes. And scientists can use that to then test to see how fat those people become in response to various stimulus in a, in a controlled environment. And one of the experiments was to overfeed twins, say about 1,000 calories a week, and then look at how much fat those twins gained. And you can see that twin A and twin B gain almost identical amounts of fat, a very strong genetic argument that obesity and weight gain is genetic. Similar studies were done with weight loss in response to physical exercise. And even more recently, it's been shown that twins have extremely similar uh, populations of bacteria in their gut, and that your interaction of your genes as a human with the genes of the bacteria is actually an inherited and, and closely linked thing. Okay, I'm not going to dwell on that too much. But overall, using twin studies and other information, there's a, s a fair consensus that about 65% of how fat you become will be determined by your genes. That's quite a substantial amount. But again, twins are very rare. Are there any twins in the audience? One, two, three. That's almost perfect. I mean, the prevalence is about 1.5% uh, in births per, per year, so you would expect to see maybe two or three. And one third of those, is anyone an identical twin? One. <laughs> one third of those, I didn't plan it, one, one third of those is, is going to be a monozygotic or identical twin. So they're very useful for studies and they're very interesting uh, as a bunch of people, but they don't really tell us what's happening across the broad population. 
And to do that, scientists have had to invent new technologies and take an entirely new approach. And I'm going to try and explain that. And again, I'm sorry, there's going to be a little bit of a school lecture here to explain to you how, what a gene is, essentially, and how we can use new technologies to find out about obesity. So our genes are made up of DNA, four different flavours of molecule, and they're stitched together into strands. <coughs> about three billion of these bases are in one cell, about two metres of DNA squashed into a nucleus about the size one-tenth of a human hair. So three billion bases, how do you get that in there? You coil it, you supercoil it, and you package it up into what we call chromosomes. And you get 23 chromosomes roughly from your dad and 23 roughly from your mum, giving you a complement of 46. Now what happens when you're ready to transmit your genes to the next generation is that, to cut a very long story short, and so it's not a high school lecture, the chromosomes which are similar for mum and dad line up next to each other and they cheat. They kind of swap information. And this creates a patchwork of variation so that the children are not just like the parents. There's a mixture of different things and an unexpected mixture of the things that were already there. This is creating Darwin's variation, only we don't think now there's a selective pressure to prevent the upward drift of body weight. But something else happens, and that is, as that DNA is being copied, you sometimes get little mistakes creeping in. It's a natural biological process, you get mistakes. And these are called variants. If these variants are serious, they're called mutations, and they can be extremely damaging and sometimes fatal, sometimes the fetus won't make it, etc. But what we can do then is take information from very large numbers of people in the population and look for how prevalent the variants are and try and relate them to something which is very simple, it's a simple measure of obesity, and in this case it would be BMI. The little guy in green might represent, for example, an extremely rare mutation like the leptin mutation that we've showed you earlier. So the approach is to take DNA from all of those people and then use powerful modern technology to sequence their genome or parts of their genome and then try to relate the variation in their genes to how fat they become using an, easily, an easy measure that maybe a GP could do in the office, starting with BMI. Now I only show you this slide just to give you an idea of the complexity of the results from an analysis like that. It's called the Genome-Wide Association Study. And what we found by sequencing across all of our chromosomes is about 60 genes out of the 30,000 or so genes, or regions close to them, are associated with obesity in one way or the other. The good news is I can try and boil that down and really simplify it, and the surprising thing, or maybe not, was that the key genes involved in being associated with obesity are genes that have their actions in the brain, either directly or indirectly, to control hunger and appetite. And essentially, one of those genes, I'll just give you an example, variations in the FTO gene have been associated with elevated levels of a hunger hormone called ghrelin that's released from the stomach when the stomach is empty. I won't go any further than that because there are many genes. But there's a problem with BMI. It's a very simple measure, but as Mandy mentioned, it's not very accurate. We can see that the guy on the right-hand side here, his mirror image, is, has a BMI of 31.7. Actually, it's probably more if you look at the cartoon. But his alter ego here has the same BMI, but he's clearly not obese. He's, he's an athlete. And we can see some real data down the sides here comparing people with the same BMI, but this guy on the right-hand side has double the fat content of the guy on the left. So to get around this, scientists created a new method using x-rays to look inside the body to determine how much fat or lean mass these people had. And when they did the same genome-wide association studies, those whole broad population scans for variants, with this information, new gene classes began to emerge, not just FTO, which was still there, but genes that were highly expressed within, for example, the adipose tissue itself, the fat tissue. Now it may seem strange getting halfway through the talk, or maybe more than halfway, you hope, and just begin to start talking about adipose tissue, but it was really using these accurate <coughs> measures of uh, assessment of fat mass and linking it now into the tissue that we're interested in in obesity that allowed us to really think through these questions in more detail. So it's important now to tell you a little bit about the fat, and I'd like to do that by just introducing where the fat actually comes from. So a fat cell will begin its life as a stem cell. You may have heard of these things in various contexts. And at some point during development or in the adult tissue, it will undergo a commitment to become a pre-fat cell, kind of kid fat cell. At some point, those cells will multiply in response to nutritional overload, so eating a lot of food, for example. Now, this is extremely important because determining those numbers is directly relevant to you. And so there was a really nice study done by scientists in Sweden where they determined fat cell number, I won't tell you how, but you can ask later if you're interested, uh, using information from atomic weapons testing. It's a bit crazy, but it worked. 
And what they found was that obese people had double the number of fat cells throughout their adult life compared to lean people. Not, not necessarily rocket science, but what it shows you and what the important thing to note is that that doubling of the fat cell number occurs during adolescence, puberty and early adulthood. So this is extremely relevant to the people, the young people in the audience, that this is a key window where you will be programmed to have the number of fat cells you will have as an adult. And the other thing is you can't really change it. So even if this person was to undergo bariatric surgery, so stomach stapling or some other method to control their weight, it doesn't change the fat cell number. The fat cells or the pre-fat cells will still be lurking there and able to accumulate lipids if that person's lifestyle changed. So this is an important finding which links genes to function and may be related to genes such as SPRI2, although that's very speculative. But back to the life of the fat cell, that fat, the pre-fat cell will then begin in response to nutrients and hormones to accumulate lipids and eventually will become a mature, a mature fat cell, sorry, containing a single lipid droplet. That's its job is to store fat away from other organs and it will obtain a blood supply and do its job of storing fat. But there's another kind of fat cell that we call brown fat. And the reason why it's called brown fat is because it has high numbers of this little cellular organelle called a mitochondria. Now, don't be afraid, it's, it sounds complicated, but it's really not. <coughs> I, I can explain to you what a mitochondria is. If you think it's a little bit like a miniature coal-fired power station. So that power station will take the chemical energy of coal and turn it into power that you plug into the national grid to drive all the processes in your home. The mitochondria does a similar thing with the chemical energy from your food to drive all the processes in the cell and in your body. So just bear that in mind. And we've known about the existence of this brown fat for a very long time, over 100 years. So we know that during the summer, bears will gorge on food and become naturally obese in preparation for winter. The cool thing is that when they hibernate, they're able to do something a little bit crazy. They can unplug their little power stations from the national grid, if you think about that analogy, and essentially waste all of that chemical energy as heat. In effect, the bear undergoes global warming, which is great for the bear. Of course, it would be terrible for the environment if we were doing that with the power stations. But essentially, they're turning the chemical energy they've stored into heat, and that preserves their life through the winter. So what? Is this relevant to humans? Yes, and we've known for maybe half that amount of time, about 50 years, that humans have brown adipose tissue. They're born with brown fat. And we can see here this little baby is nicely heated by having brown fat when they're born. But these newborns lose that ability as they start to thermoregulate, to control their body temperature through other means, such as wearing clothes or through the thyroid system, etc., etc. So everyone thought this story was dead until scientists studying cancer, and they were looking for energy use in cancer cells, discovered in their patients that the cells somewhere around deep parts of the neck and around the spine were lighting up. And it turned out that these were adult humans that had brown adipose tissue. And you could switch on that adipose tissue to burn calories by exposing these people to the cold. So thin people tend to have quite a lot of brown adipose tissue, obese people don't. And so the idea was that maybe one cause of obesity is that we don't have adequate stores of brown fat for one reason or another. And so the pharmaceutical industry is now desperately searching for ways to activate brown adipose tissue without the need for cold exposure, which so far really is necessary for full activation of brown adipose tissue. So I'm going to change tack now just to talk a little bit about the research that goes on in our lab in this area and change maybe the, the viewpoint here uh, a little bit. So I want to go back again to revisit these horrible statistics that show that over the last 30 years, everyone, or at least 40% of the population, you might feel it's everyone, has become obese. But uh, I'm an optimist, and, and if I extend the y-axis up to its full extent, 100, what we can see, actually, is that there's two things happening. One is that the increase in prevalence has begun to level off. And secondly, most of those people, 60%, are non-obese, even though they're exposed to the same obesogenic environment. Why is that? Well, is this evidence for lean genes? By the same argument that genes may contribute to obesity, why shouldn't genes contribute to leanness? And armed with the further information that accurate measures of fat mass had picked out genes expressed or genes that are functional in the adipose tissue, we set out to search for lean genes expressed in adipose tissue. And to do this, we used a very unique model. They're called the polygenic lean and fat mouse model. This is a mouse model that we created by selecting the fattest mice, boys and girls, and the thinnest mice, boys and girls, and mating them together. And over a number of generations, 60 in this case, we created a divergent artificial selection 
for leanness <coughs> and fatness, enriching for the genes that would cause those two things. And to give you some sense of scale, if this was to be translated into humans, it would be like when the Romans left, some evil feudal lord <laughs> gathered all the people in Britain and forced the fatter people to mate with the fatter people and the thinner people with the thinner people until the present day. So that's the scale of that experiment, but in the mouse line. Okay. So there's an enrichment for genes. I'm not saying that that would be relevant to humans, but there's an enrichment of genes that would drive, in our case, an interest, the leanness in this particular line. So we used information on the genetics of these animals, which we had a fairly good understanding of, to discover that one gene, which was highly functional or abundant in the white adipose tissue of these animals, was driving leanness. And what we think this gene is doing is, is really acting as a maintenance and repair protein within these little power cells, the mitochondria of the cell. And that allows the fat cell to send its fats away to the liver, where it can be safely oxidized, detoxified, or burned. So that's our contribution to, to this particular research at the minute. But what are the possibilities in the last couple of slides just while I close up? Well, in the present day, it might take, the estimates are that it's going to take about $1,000 to sequence a single human genome. That sounds like a lot of money to you, but when this was first done 15 years ago, it took 10 years and $3 billion to get the first human genome sequence. So this is now extremely readily available, at least in theory. And <coughs> Most modern machines can pump out maybe five genome sequences a day, not all the information, but enough to work with. And that's quite scary. Moreover, you can buy off the internet kits that will allow you to have a certain amount of diagnostic information about your genes. It will even tell you how much Neanderthal DNA, so they claim that you actually have very interesting. But there are big caveats before that this information can be used properly in clinical medicine. I'm not a clinician, but it's pretty clear that this is something that's important to all of us because we might all want to be sequenced and then change our lifestyles. There are still problems with the sequencing technology. They don't always agree, for example, when different technologies are used to sequence the same person. So until we understand the technology and until we understand how the variance in those genes actually affects disease, there may be five to ten years and a lot of ethical and clinical and scientific debate before that information can be used on a daily basis in the clinic, and maybe even longer. I can be corrected on that. But what can we do? Well, we can take sensible approaches, and you probably knew the answer to most of this before you came in. First of all is to take exercise, and maybe expose yourself to cold. This guy can do both at the same time, being a nice swimmer. But maybe turn down the central heating and don't put the jumper on, because you're just thermoregulating the same way. And, of course, avoid fatty, sugary foods, especially the combination of those sugary foods, because they're extremely powerful in making you gain weight and making your brain forget how much weight you're gaining. And, of course, as your mum would have told you, eat a balanced diet with plenty of protein, carbohydrate, fats, and fibre. It's fairly sensible advice, and it works. So I'm just going to finish there. I want to thank all the people in my lab who are working on various parts of these projects, uh, including uh, Martin, Rod and Rona and the PhD students, some of whom you might have met earlier as you were doing your, your lab tour. Uh, yeah, it's Claire, Kate and Matt. Uh, and I'd just like to finish there and uh, hand back over to, to Karen. Thank you.